As our world becomes more technologically advanced and ultra-modern, more and more people have been turning to ancient wisdom in search of meaning. Cases in point, yoga, Buddhism, and Tai Chi. Now, in the realm of ancient Greek philosophy, two schools in particular have experienced a huge resurgence in recent years, Stoicism and Platonism. Now, there were many philosophical schools in ancient Greece, so why are these two making such a big comeback? And what value, meaning, or practical wisdom can they offer us? That's what we're going to find out today. Hi, I'm Lantern Jack, and in today's episode of Ancient Greece Declassified, we'll be looking at these two pillars of classical philosophy, Platonism and Stoicism. Now, before we jump into the conversation, a quick timeline for those who are interested. Plato founded his school in Athens, called the Academy, in the 380s BC. Zeno of Citium founded his school, later known as the Stoa or Stoicism, also in Athens in around 300 BC. Now, both of these schools continued to exist for many hundreds of years, enduring long after the Roman conquest of Greece. During those many centuries, groups of philosophers in each school incessantly debated, refined, and expanded upon the work of their school's founders. But eventually, well into the Roman period, Athens' status as a prestigious college town and the amount of philosophical activity that was happening there declined. That's why the most famous Roman Stoics all lived and wrote elsewhere. Now, in the 200s AD, more than 500 years after Plato's death, his philosophy was rekindled in Egypt by the Greeks and Greek-speaking Egyptians living there. Figures such as Plotinus and Porphyry took Plato's ideas and developed them much further, incorporating elements from numerous other philosophical schools as well. So, when we say Neoplatonism, we're talking about Platonic-inspired philosophy from the 200s AD onward. That's the basic outline. Now, I am thrilled to welcome back on the program someone who has studied how human thought systems have evolved over the millennia. John Verveke is a cognitive scientist at the University of Toronto. He has a fantastic YouTube series called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, which I'm sure many of you know about already. We had him on this show a few months ago to talk about Plato's cave and why Plato's theory of forms is still relevant to debates about human cognition. Check out that video here if you missed it. John Verveke, welcome back to Ancient Greece Declassified. It's a great pleasure to be here, Jack, and I'm really looking forward to this topic. It's exciting. Cool. So I know that you've spent you know, an entire YouTube series answering the, the following question, but if you could give us in a word, why are more and more people today turning to ancient wisdom practices? Yeah, uh, I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. I won't repeat all the arguments for why we have the meaning <laughs> crisis, uh, both uh, perennial and uh, 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 current, present uh, issues, historical and structural. Um, so I'll just say that the West is experiencing a meaning crisis and a significant way of understanding that w meaning crisis as, as a, a wisdom famine. So people are in, often intuitively or somewhat more reflectively aware of this wisdom famine. Um, they go, they look for where they can go to get that uh, opportunity and guidance um, and vetting uh, for the cultivation of wisdom. The universities do not provide it. Um, the, the political arena, although often promising it, is just l literally ideological warfare. It's not about any transformative uh, transformation of character, cultivation of virtue, etc. Um, they turn to a lot of the legacy religions. Now, there'll be a couple of exceptions we'll talk about. Um, and uh, by and large, they find that they are, they're not relevant for that. It's not so much that they disbelieve the doctrines, which are also in question, or there's been sor sort of moral a failure in these institutions, what they have, then that matters. Um, it's, but it is much that they, this, this need to cultivate wisdom and connectedness is not being addressed there. So this is what they often mean by, uh, they, they classify themselves as these people as nuns, N-O-N-E-S, N -O -N -E -S, no official religious affiliation. But if you look at them, they also almost always describe themselves as spiritual, but not religious. And the way to understand that is not religious means they reject the legacy religions because they're not giving them a pl place to cultivate wisdom so they're doing it on their own but they're often doing it in this autodidactic often egocentric you know, way that is very very problematic so people who are becoming aware that they shouldn't be doing this just autodidactically are turning towards 
more established traditions and even reviving ones like Stoicism and Neoplatonism. Right. So as I mentioned in a previous episode on Stoicism, there are probably more practicing Stoics alive now than there have been in the one and a half millennia since the Roman Empire collapsed. And <clears throat> Platonism is also making a big comeback. There are a lot of intellectuals today that claim to be Platonists, such as mm. yourself. And yes. so what I want to do on today's episode is to explore these two philosophies, but in a way that you couldn't really do in a philosophy department today. So let me explain what that means to our listeners. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Academic, academic philosophers today uh, look at philosophies, schools of thought, thought systems analytically, and they, they consider them essentially as logical systems. And they try to see, okay, what, what are the arguments? What are the assumptions? Um, mm -hmm. What are the specious arguments? Uh, what are the alternatives? All that kind of stuff. But what you do, and what I would like to uh, draw your attention to here is, you know, to think of these schools of thought as pieces of social technology mm -hmm. that were, that were innovated at particular times because of certain needs, certain crises, and they they served real functions like like any piece of technology, and they evolved over time because both of these schools, Platonism and Stoicism, were refined over many many centuries from mm. you know 350 BC for Plato and 300 BC for Zeno, founder of the Stoics, all the way until the end of antiquity and perhaps even through the Byzant Byzantine Empire. Mm -hmm. These schools of thought were consistently refined. And so um, they've had a remarkable history. They've, they've gone, they've mm -hmm. influenced, both of them have influenced Christianity heavily. They've influenced modern philosophy, and now they're being revived. So I want to see with you what, I want to analyze these technologies as yep. like why they've survived, why they were successful, and what utility they can offer us today. Does that sound like a good plan? Not a good plan. This is a great plan. I think this is exactly, okay. exactly how we should be trying to, uh, you know, uh, interact with these, uh, with these philosophical frameworks. Uh, uh, it, 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 they, they, you know, understanding them as ways of life and uh, frameworks for transformation. Um, yeah, I mean, this is. I think this is exactly the right way. Um, I think the, the the first way, the academic way. It's only possible justification is if it's completely in service to the way that we're talking about. And it's right. not right now. It's just stands alone. <laughs> I know that's a strong yeah. thing to say, but <laughs> I think we do a disservice to these philosophies by not representing them as they are intended to be received. Well, let me just test your current stance because I want to see how it'll perhaps change over the course of the conversation. But right now, when you look at Stoicism, and you look at Platonism, and you can look at you know Neoplatonism if, if you like the more <clears throat> yeah. the latest version. Let's say which of those strikes you as a more advanced philosophy or advanced thought system? Well, I mean to be honest, uh, and I just gave a talk about this at Ralston. Uh, uh, hmm. uh, I was invited down for lecture. I was. Um, I think Neoplatonism, but um, here's where it might not quite fit the way you pose the question because I think. You get Neoplatonism by integrating Platonic spirituality, um, Aristotelian science and epistemology, and then uh, uh, basically Stoic ethics, the disciplining of ascent, the disciplining of action, the disciplining of desire. I think all of, I mean, it, I think Stoicism, play, and because also the way it developed the idea of the Logos, which also plays a huge role in Neoplatonism, Stoicism is a, is, is a significant component. I, I see Stoicism as alive within uh, Neoplatonism. Um, and so um, I, 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 I don't want to just sort of do this jujitsu move on you or anything like that, but mm -hmm. that's that's how I honestly think about it. Um, and so I think about it, uh, Neoplatonism is very similar to Zen, the way Zen integrates Buddhism, um, uh, Taoism, and aspects of Shinto and gives you this very comprehensive thing. I think Neoplatonism uh, did the same thing. Uh, and I think, I, I think those three components I mean, those are basically other than the Epicureans. Those are three. Those are the three of the four major schools in the ancient world, right? The Epicureans don't really get um, taken into Neoplatonism very readily. Uh, there's there's some ways in which you could do a little bit, but mm -hmm. the you know the Platonism, the Aristotelianism, the Stoicism they are the they are the three uh, they are the three vertices of the triangle that is Neoplatonism. 
and we can explore this integration or syncretism uh, as we go on. But let's kind of then let's take Stoicism first, even though it came after Platonism, but it's sure. more pop, it's more popular today. So let's um, yeah. What are the strengths and weaknesses of Stoicism, and why did it rise to uh, to prominence? So I think Stoicism rises to prominence exactly during uh, the period of Hellenistic domicide. Uh, so after the breakup of Alexander's empire, uh, you get a lot of uh, you know diaspora people moving around. Uh, you get the you get the four remaining empires, and they're all warring with each other for like a century. Um, and so uh, this is a world that lo has lost most of the stable structures that existed at the time, even of uh, of Aristotle. You know, people lived in a polis. They were they were near their government. Everybody around them spoke the same language, had the same religion. There's a long history of ancestry there. They've been in place, etc. After the breakup, and that you have the four kingdoms fighting, right? People are moving around. They may speak different language, have different religion than you. The 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 person ruling you may be like literally thousands of kilometers away. You have no contact with them. Um, there's people around you that speak a different language. Uh, so there was a lot, uh, somewhat similar in important ways to the way globalism has had a huge impact, uh, uh, you know, a lot of negative impact uh, uh, on local cultures. Um, and so you get the rise of the idea of the philosopher as the physician of the soul, as the physician of the psyche. And I see Stoicism as real. So you get, you get, you get a line coming out of Socrates into Plato, and it's going that particular way. It's getting very academic, literally. Um, and then Stoicism comes through Antisthenes, and obviously through the, the Cynics, and they're much more about um, how can we alleviate this, this, this sense of domicile, this sense of homelessness, anxiety, uh, insecurity. And you see the Cynics basically rejecting civilization, um, and the Stoics saying, no, 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 that's, that's a mistake. The mistake isn't sort of like w what you're setting your heart on, it's how you're setting your heart on. So anything can cause you, right? And that, that's one of my favorite uh, Marcus Aurelius's quotes that really puts a nice spin on this. He says, where it's, it's possible to be happy even in a palace. Um, and, <laughs> and so, right? Um, and, and, yeah. and so this idea of the Stoics do this thing of like, let's diagnose um, your illness, your psychological illness, if I could put it that way. And let's not forget Stoicism is a direct um, ancestor of CBT, one of our most prominent forms of psychotherapy right now. Um, Cognitive it's behavioral right. therapy. Right, right, right. And so yeah. uh, you, get the, you get the development of, of some very powerful practices organized into a coherent way of life that people can aspire to and identify with. And so I think that's why Stoicism arose. Um, I'll stop there and let you comment that, then I, yeah. maybe we can back on what I think Stoicism offers. No, that, that, um, that's very convincing to me. And if I can add the uh, <clears throat> ancient Greece declassified spin on this, which my listeners have heard before, I mean, you know, you have these thousands of city-states in the ancient Mediterranean. And for several hundred years, philosophers are trying to understand how can you live well in the city state right and then mm. uh, so a lot a lot of the greek ethics was actually social technology to enable cooperative non-monarchical governments like democracies mm. and aristocracies and republics <clears throat> but the polis still was the the micro world that you inhabited right the the, the mm. source of your meaning and now you have these huge kingdoms that have bulldozed over um you know all of these polis and people find themselves as you said in a globalized world they don't always speak the same language as the rulers right it's yeah, um, and yeah. so stoicism offers a way to soothe the soul from this meaning crisis that arose right yes yes um and I i've heard it suggested that stoicism actually enabled or it helped enable larger societies to form and that mm -hmm. um you know the roman empire perhaps couldn't have lasted as long as it did without the ideas that were developed by Stoics and other philosophers. Not that all the Romans were Stoics, right? But these ideas have a way of permeating um, mm -hmm. government I ideologies, uh, 
daily life kind of ways of thinking. So um, would you say that one of the aspects, one of the valuable aspects of socialism as a technology was that it, it enabled large scale societies? I, I think, uh, I mean, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, uh, not everybody is a stoic, uh, but you certainly get mm. a large proportion of the aristocracy, but you also have soldiers carrying around in their knapsack uh, Epictetus's manual for living. Um, so it definitely, mm. we, we have evidence for it, you know, capturing um, sort of the ruling bureaucracy, the class from which the bureau ruling bureaucracy was drawn, but it's also definitely deeply influential in the army for a significant amount of time. And in Stoicism, is a, a, an excellent philosophy for a soldier. I, I, it really is. It even uses a lot of military metaphors. And of course, St. Paul picks that up when he talks about the, the shield of, uh, the, what is it, the shield of faith and the sword of truth or something. I can't remember uh, that whole that whole thing. Um, um, and so there's that, that it, it's capturing at least two big players, the bureaucracy and the army, and that those are the two things that you want well coordinated if you're going to manage a larger uh, empire. I'm not trying to justify the Roman Empire or anything like that. Um, but I also think the notion of that your home isn't your polis, but and this you know Socrates this goes back to Socrates in many ways. Stoicism is the religion, the religious philosophy of internalizing Socrates, um, and so. Uh, you've got the idea that your home is the cosmos, um, that the, the cosmopolitan, your polis is mm -hmm. the cosmos. And remember, yeah. cosmos doesn't mean what we mean by universe. It means this cosmetic. It means this beautifully well-ordered um, entity to which you always have rational access and in which you can always rationally home yourself and thereby not feel this domicide that is prevalent during the Hellenistic meaning crisis. So I think both that cosmic or cosmopolitan, I should say, orientation and the fact that we seem to have good evidence for it capturing uh, large parts of the bureaucracy in the army, I think that you can make a good case for it in enabling uh, uh, the Roman Empire in a powerful way. Yeah. So then one, one strength of Stoicism uh, over, I guess, all other ancient philosophical schools, I think, is that it's the most scalable of all the schools, right? Like, there's mm. no limit to which it can be scaled. Whereas Plato and Aristotle's philosophy are kind of, they're tailored to the polis setting. So they're not as easy to scale, perhaps. Right, right. I think, I think in comparison to Platonism and Aristotelianism, and I think even Epicureanism in a certain way, although Epicureanism also arises to trying to meet Hellenistic domicide. Stoicism, Stoicism gives you a way uh, for gives pe different people at different within different strata a way of committing to the project of civilization, where you understand civilization as that project of trying to bring of much of humanity. The Stoics also introduce the brotherhood of man, right? Mm -hmm. Bringing all of human civilization is a project of trying to bring all of humanity into that concord with. The, the, with the beautiful order so that everybody is uh, is optimally homed in their existence. And so, yeah. Now, I would say that Neoplatonism, of course, also becomes uh, very, very scalable, especially when it becomes Christian Neoplatonism. But we can mm -hmm. talk about that in a bit. Yeah. Now, there's another aspect of Stoicism that may be a strength or a weakness or both, uh, and that is the insistence or obsession with logos with reason yeah. um, yes. the stoics think that the entire universe is um permeated by a logos by reason that mm -hmm. every human is fundamentally a rational being that mm -hmm. although most humans are not rational at most times that's because we're like malfunctioning machines but the machine that we are is a rational machine it's like we're built to be these perfect calculators but we glitch all the time and stoicism offers a way to perfect the, the the logical machine that you are this is in contrast to platonism which holds that the soul has actually most of the soul is irrational much like freud you know there's like kind of a dark uh unknown unconscious uh, area of the soul and the stoics say no 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 you're just fully rational so i i, I have my thoughts on this of course but what's your take is that is that a strength or a weakness 
And or first of all, is it even true? You know, what's your take as a cognitive <laughs> scientist about that? Okay, so I mean, this this is a very important point. And first, I want to I want to steal person the Stoics before I make any criticism of this position. Can you explain what that means to steal a person? Oh, steal steal. So the yeah. opposite. We used to have you know a straw man is you set up. A, a mm -hmm. very weak version of, of something that you want to criticize and you criticize it. And then we used to say you steal man something as opposed to straw man. You okay. give it its strongest possible presentation. And then to make the language less sexist, we now say you yeah. steal person because okay. it's actually person. <laughs> it's about yeah, yeah. real personhood, right? And so you steal mm -hmm. person a position. So you present it in its best possible light. Uh, as best as best you can before you put any criticisms against it, because the idea is, um, you know, you're not pursuing the truth if you're attacking a straw man. Um, Got it. You're, ju okay. you're just promoting your own p uh, position. So first of all, I, I want to um, I want to indicate that we have to avoid. I would argue, and I, I want to see what you think about this. We have to avoid a Cartesian anachronism with the Stoicism. Their notion of ratio and logos is not Cartesian uh, rationalism. I mean, uh, the fact that, for example, the, the, the Logos, I mean, I think Hadoe Wright has to do with these different domains, you know, uh, basically, uh, you, you know, inferential judgment, assent, and then it has to be with desire, your affective life, and then, of course, action, how you actually manage your agency. And so their rationality is not just logical in the standard sense of, implication relationships between propositions. In fact, they regard that kind of logic, the logic of discourse, as the least important of all of the rationalities. Um, so first of all, you have to have a much more encompassing notion of rationality. So it, it you know, and, and this is one of the things, again, from Socrates, ta erotica, uh, Socrates knew what to care about, knew what to love. So there's a rationality of care, and, and then there's mm -hmm. a rationality of, well, uh, how do you properly, uh, take on your agency, which is very much this project of the rationality of identification. Um, like, when you, what, what identities are you assuming? What identities are you assigning to things? And bring that into your awareness. That's why proshosh, attention, and prochiron, having readiness, having things ready to mind are integral parts of this. Um, so I, I, I kind of want to push back on any sort of computational metaphors for the, the Stoic notion of logos. I think logos is not properly translated by our current post-Cartesian, post-Whitehead and Russell notion of logic. I don't think it, that it's because it's this much more, it's, it has, like we said earlier, it has an important therapeutic and aspirational aspect to it that is not captured by our modern notion of logic. And I think when you, if you give that to the Stoics, I think you're getting much closer to what I argue is a correct notion of rationality. Did you want to say something about that? Yeah, so that's a great point. And I, let me just then clarify what I meant by the Stoics were obsessed with reason, and then I'll let you uh, yeah. continue. So um, reason for the Stoics is essentially the perfect use of language. And language, and that includes logic, but you know, language includes concepts that we are not born with, but inevitably come to have. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's no, they don't believe in, social constructs, like the, the, the important things in life are not social constructs for the Stoics. They are, they are, um, ennoi, they're, they're like concepts that are in the mind. And although you're not, you don't have them as a baby, you inevitably come to acquire yep. these concepts. Yep. And if yes. you use these concepts correctly, if you use language, which is a natural phenomenon correctly, then you are fully rational. But the thing is that they thought that thinking at its deepest levels was linguistic in a sense. So they thought mm. that, that your mind is constantly, you know, when you're observing the world, it's not like you see colors and those colors yeah. are then synthesized by your neurons into shapes and then some process does some pattern recognition. And you know what I mean? For them, yeah. you are receiving basically linguistic content, yes. proposition, you're receiving propositional content in your mind. Like the universe yeah. is full of almost sentences and you are receiving them and you are using your language power and your logical powers to yeah, yeah. Un understand the world, right? And so that's what I mean by they're obsessed with reason. And so back to you now, is that, um, 
What's your take on so that? So I, I, I think that's right. Uh, I think if you, uh, so I think the, so far we're, there's no inconsistency between what you're saying and what I'm saying. I was trying to open up the domains um, and I, I wanted to include like attention, and, and especially, um, and, and you know, and, and, and you know, change in perspective, like the, the you from above, or you know, the premeditatio. So we should also talk about some of the exercises because they also indicate, I think, more clearly uh, uh, what the Stoic conception of ratio uh, or logos is. Um, now that idea that. Cognition is at its core. You have what Jerry Fodor called the language of thought. Um, this was a, this was an idea that was central to the birth of cognitive science, and so and it's still one that many people. It's called first generation cogsci. Many people in cogsci still espouse. Now, here's where I would break with the Stoics, and I would say, uh, I do not think that all of cognition is inherently language of thought. I do think there is propositional knowing but I think there's non-propositional knowing. And here's one of the great differences between Neoplatonism, even between Platonism, if we, if we agree with the work of Gonzalez and Highland and all the third-way Platonists, that non-propositional cognition is very central to Platonism. It's clearly central to Neoplatonism. And I tend to think that there is good evidence for non-propositional thought, procedural knowing, uh, perspectival, and participatory. And then what I would argue to strengthen that a little bit is that a lot of the Stoic practices involve these other kinds of knowing that don't seem to be well described as propositional in, in nature. Um, That's actually really helpful. So just to give you a bit of extra context for this, um, some of my listeners will have seen uh, the interview with cognitive behavioral therapist uh, Donald Robertson, and I'll link to that yes. here. Yes, um, yes, and, excellent. And he was, you know, he was talking trash about Plato's model and saying it was Plato's soul model was a disaster, whereas the Stoic model is great. And I was pushing back and I said, don't most cognitive scientists today agree that a lot of the thinking that's a lot of the processing in our mind is beyond what consciousness can access yes. and beyond, you know, and he was essentially saying that the fact that cognitive behavioral therapy can kind of access your mind, like interface with almost all aspects of your thinking, that that speaks in favor of the Stoic view. Um, I have and... a response to that, by the okay, way. Okay, please, yes. Which is, uh, the effectiveness of CBT is going down with each generation of therapists. Wow, um, really? Uh, it's going down because, right, and we, by the way, this is, a, this is generally the case for many psychotherapies, because the doctrine typically doesn't capture all of the other things that are going on by the people who initiate the therapy. Um, and this is, this is a, this is a, this is called even called the dodo problem in psychotherapy, which there doesn't seem to be much significant difference between many therapies because all that really matters is the ability to create rapport between the therapist and the client. Um, so I would say, well, compare that to Rogerian uh, therapy in which you're bo mostly just listening um, and giving positive regard, right, to the, and that opens, like, and so um, I, I, I don't deny that CBT is evidence-based, but his argument depends on the claim that it is in some sense, you know, the, the, the only therapy and that it's sort of, Evidential strength has been, for efficaciousness, has been consistent. That's not totally accurate, um, and 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 you also have to. So first, that's the first reply, right? So I think it misrepresents the position of CBT within psychotherapy. That's why you'll find very very few therapists who are pure CBT. They're almost always eclectic. They're mixing CBT with other things, which then supports the point I'm making. Why are they being eclectic? Why don't they just rely on CBT? Because they're aware of this and they need to tap into other kinds of knowings with other kinds of therapies. So the overwhelming majority, uh, and this talk to Greg Enriquez about this, he knows it even better than I do. Most psychotherapists are not purist, they're eclectic for the reasons that I've indicated, and that tends to support the argument I'm making. That's the first reply. Yeah. The second reply is he, the, the fact that you're using um, CBT structures, uh, right, it doesn't necessarily mean that the processes that are being triggered by the language are themselves linguistic processes. 
That's mm -hmm. just a causal error, right? That's just a, yeah. you know, I, I need this to cause that, so there, therefore that is identical to the cause. That's No, it's not. I mean, so the thing about the, the, the way CBT, like, so for example, CBT uses language to get you to do reframing. But reframing is not a propositional practice. It's an intentional practice of redistributing what you find salient and relevant in order to provoke something like an insight. An insight is like this thing that happens between the hemispheres. It's happening largely ineffably. And so just the, the fact that the language is being used to train reframing doesn't mean the reframing is itself as a linguistic process. So those are my two, fun, those are, those are yeah. my two replies. So since I have you here, I'm going to take the opportunity to test some ideas on you, okay? okay. So um, I think Plato's view of the soul, and which is also essentially the Freudian view, and it's also basically my view, is that if you think of the human mind as this huge, let's call it like a, a massive spaceship, okay? It's like this very, very yeah. complicated machine, right? And on the side of it, it has a little screen. And on that screen, that's the screen is all is the only interface you have to understand what's happening inside the spaceship. That's okay? right. And obviously this screen can never fully capture what's happening inside the spaceship. It's a very, very limited uh, mm -hmm. distillation of some information. Okay, so I think Plato, Freud, um, and I would think that that's what logos or conscious, conscious thinking using language is. It's like a very, very limited access to this massive black box, which is the human mind. Whereas the... Stoics believe that you have this giant screen and it tells you everything potentially about what's happening inside the spaceship. So which of those two systems, which of those two um, uh, metaphors, I guess, do you think is closer to to the truth? So you're right. I think the Stoics are much closer to Descartes. Descartes had a similar view, mm -hmm. uh, which is why the, uh, the you know, Freud and everything post Freud is very challenging for the Cartesian framework because Cogito ergo sum only mm -hmm. works if the mind has sort of a complete access to itself um, and, and its essence, right? If, 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 if in the act of self-reflective awareness, I'm not actually get grasping the essence of mind, then I, I'm as ignorant to myself as I am of the world and the whole Cartesian thing collapses. And I think you get, you get sort of something proto-Cartesian in the, only in this area, please remember that, uh, in the Stoics. Um, and I would say that that's fundamentally wrong. I think that's fundamentally wrong. I mean, I would ask the Stoics, uh, what's happening in my conscious mind such that the noises coming out of my face hole uh, or out of Jack's face hole are turning into ideas in my mind? Please tell me through introspection how that's happening, how the noises are becoming ideas. I mean, it's just read, it's readily and easily apparently available to all of us to disconfirm the hypothesis that consciousness gives us access uh, to most of our mind. For, and, and then functionally, it makes no sense. Imagine a screen that's as complicated and as big as the spaceship. What possible function does the screen then perform? It's just another spaceship that has to be understood, right? And so it doesn't make any functional sense either. So both empirically, if you just check, there is so much of our behavior, our in deeply intelligent, sophisticated behavior. Do you, like, wait, bend your finger. What are you doing to bend your finger? No idea. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so navigating the environment, like all of this, and this is part of the whole cognitive revolution, the whole part of 4E Cogsci, all of this, right, non-conscious processing is, is where most of your intelligence is found. Now, consciousness is important. I'm not denying that. But I'm saying most of your intelligence is unconscious. And that's why, like, you can, you can, you know, jump up and spike a volleyball in the middle of a game. And your conscious awareness of what you're doing of the, is like some small subtended part of everything that's going on. And or, try to make a robot to do that. And you'll know how sophisticated yeah. How really cognitively sophisticated that is. Okay, so, right? And, and so what that means is that that's where most of your intelligence lies. And secondly, and, and these two reasons are, these two things are not disconnected from each other. That's where most of the meaning-making machinery lies. Your, your, connect, your sense of being connected to yourself, to each other, and the world. Now, that does not mean that consciousness cannot reframe that, alter it, restructure it. But 
it's very much the servant of uh, of the body than the master. Love it. Well, for the sake of fairness, you know, I would love to actually have Donald Robertson and you both on the show so that you can battle us out. I, 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 I have <laughs> tremendous respect for him. Yeah. Uh, um, and so I, I, I would I, I, I would be happy to argue yeah. uh, with him about sure. these things in, in good faith. Now, I happen to agree with you. Um, but the interesting issue for me is that this this debate, I think, has been going on since time immemorial. Um, on the one hand, I think most humans want to believe that they know what they think when they're thinking, and they know how they're thinking. And yet, as you point out, ex you know, many experiences show us that we have no idea what we're thinking. And mm -hmm. I think this is why early humans believed that, you know, a pantheon of gods were all whispering different suggestions mm -hmm. to them, as you see in Homer, right? Yeah. Um, so there's always been this tension between people that want to say, no, 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 like, we can rationally understand ourselves and people like Plato who say, actually, rationality is amazing. It's what you should focus your life on, but it only gives you, you know, access to a small piece of your soul. <coughs> yes. and, and so it's interesting to me that so Plato comes along with this radical theory that the soul has three parts, two of which are irrational or non-rational and are inherently stronger than the rational part. Yeah, so that, I, I want to. I, yeah, that qualification yes. is important. The irrationality is not in, in any part, but in the disharmony between them. I think that's a that's an important qualifier. Okay, so we can get to that. But so he he has this theory, which I think is uh, the most advanced uh, and modern looking theory of the ancient world. And the Stoics come after yeah. that, and they say, no, 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 it's just reason, and we can fully understand human thinking. And so my question is like. It's like we keep discovering the, the black box in our mind, and yet we keep on coming back to this insistence that it's actually transparent and we can understand it. Yeah, let me give you another example. You get yeah. the emergence after Heidegger, who's mm -hmm. talking so much about Dasein and all this stuff that's happening below the level of, you know, uh, of, of, of propositional thinking. He's, he's the godfather of poor Ecog Psi and all, all, all the non-propositional cognition. But he gives birth to existentialism, which says, you know, you're a completely self-defining, self-interpreting you know, thing. And that's just why Sartre has all these problems with the Freudian unconscious. And he launches all these critiques because it seems to undermine, uh, you know, one of the core ideas of existentialism. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree. We keep I, I'm just giving you another mm -hmm. example, you yeah. know, close in our own time where you get this reversal happening. And it's going, well, how is that happening? Why is that mm -hmm. happening? Um, and so, I, I mean, part of it is, um, so this is not an argument of justification. This is a, a, an attempt at theoretical explanation. But I think it, part of it is there's a sense in which um, autonomy um, is a significant contributor to our sense of agency and meaning. Um, and autonomos, you know, we, we, we govern ourselves um, and we, we we tend to have a very um, how do, how do, we have, tend to have a very homuncular understanding of what autonomy is. Uh, we tend to think it requires this sort of. We tend to think autonomy works the way a bureaucracy works. There must be a boss, and then everybody underneath in a hierarchical, and there must be some sort of central boss in us that's in charge of everything. Um, and that is unfortunately a very bad model of autonomy. I, I get it that it's a prevalent model because we're we're surrounded by it. But that's not how your brain is organized. In fact, that's not how your brain within your body is organized. That's not what. That's not how autonomy works. Autonomy works through the various complex processes of trade-off relationships and self-organization. Uh, so it's very proper, and I would I will I will argue this to talk about like a paramecium being autonomous in a way that a tornado isn't. It's a self-directing. It generates norms that it's then bound to by itself. It's the source of its own norms, because that's what it is to be a living thing. But it, right, you don't think of a, a paramecium exercising anything that corresponds to that this sort of boss model. Um, and so I think we, we, there's a, there, we, we, we have a correct intuition that autonomy is sort of central to our agency, as our, to our living agency. But then we grab from culture a hierarchical model of autonomy that 
really misleads us, which is, is unless there's an I that somehow the boss, I don't have it. And, and, and this is where the Eastern religions and philosophies are very, very helpful because they have fundamentally different notions of how one gets that autonomy uh, that do not involve uh, that hierarchical governance. Right. Now, there's a debate about whether the Stoics had a notion of autonomy. You do find the word autonomia in one uh, orator who was influenced by the Stoics, yeah. so they might have had that. But they definitely had the notion that the word refers to, which is the yes. idea of le legislating a law unto thyself. Yes. And that, and that law is reason. And so I think – so this is this is the – what you and I think is the fundamental – problem with Stoicism, which others might think it's the fundamental great thing about it. But the Stoics believed that reason can be self-regulating that um, or self-directing, right? Like there's this um, discourse by Epictetus where he says he goes through the various arts, you know, like writing and yeah. speaking and math and everything and says each of these arts is directed by something else. Like when you write, yeah. that writing is directed by your thinking, and right. And he kind of concludes to this from this that all these arts are directed by reason. So therefore, reason is the thing that can direct itself. And I think, um, I think that's problematic. And and the best way I've I've heard somebody explain this is actually Tolstoy, in his epilogues to War and Peace. And he doesn't claim to be the originator of this idea, but I think he he explains it. Yeah really nicely. Um, he says that humans, I'll use modern language here, uh, but he basically says that humans have these two kind of like computer programs running at all times in their minds. And they're always running, but they're fundamentally incompatible with each other. And one of those programs is consciousness, the, of which the fundamental principle is, I can blank, like, right. I can move my finger now, I can hang up this call, I can go get another coffee. And the other um, program that's always running is logic, of which the fundamental principle is that everything has a cause. Mm -hmm. And we can add to that everything is either caused or random. Either way, those two things are incompatible, because if everything has a cause, then me move my finger has a cause and that and that cause has a cause and I can trace that mm -hmm. chain of causality back to before I was born and therefore I am not the originator of mm -hmm. this movement. Mm -hmm. And so it's not mm -hmm. that I can, I actually can't, but but in order to be alive, I have to think that I can. <laughs> and in order to <laughs> function rationally, I have to think that I can understand causes. And so um and the Stoics want to just iron over that, say, no, no, no. Reason can and it also can understand causality yes is that right yeah so uh, many people have said and i know you you, you sort of you, you you touch on this a bit, a bit on your book i think or maybe maybe in a conversation we had i can't remember i might be blurring them the stoics <laughs> maybe are proto-compatibilists uh that you can be simultaneously rational and causally determined and mm -hmm. there's no contradiction between that and I, again i want to recommend that uh, that 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 is an important position uh, to reflect upon, uh, and, and, but here I want to respond to Tolstoy, okay. and, 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 and because and I and I'm gonna and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do something. It's a bit of a pun, but it's right. So you have an autonomic <laughs> autonomous. Mm -hmm. You have an yep. autonomic nervous system, okay, and its job is to calibrate your level of arousal, um, right. And I, I mean metabolic arousal. I don't mean sexual arousal. Sexual arousal <laughs> is just a subset of metabolic arousal. Yeah. Now, what, okay. what happens is you ha it's subdivided into two systems, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. The sympathetic, and notice the language I'm going to use, the sympathetic is biased. Biased to is interpreting as much of the world as it can as a threat or opportunity and therefore raising your level of arousal. The parasympathetic is biased the other way. It's biased to trying to see as much of the world as safe and secure so that you can relax and regenerate. And then what you do, what, what, what biology does is it puts these two into a push-pull relationship with each other. Each system is trying to suppress the other and trying, right? And what happens is no one system ever totally predominates. 
And you don't just get into an average where you're kind of middlingly aroused all time in some sort of Canadian fashion, right? It, it, it's constantly, it moves around. It, now, it, here's the thing, and here's the idea about dynamical systems. There's no boss in there. There's no one person mm. deciding. It's called opponent processing, and you link them together in this fashion so that you're constantly evolving your arousal. Your attention is doing it too. Remember when we talked about this? Part of your attention is wandering away. One system, the default node web network is wandering away. The task focus is bringing you back. Variation and selection, and, and they're in opponent processing, and you're constantly evolving your attention. And then the, the attentional system and the arousal system are constantly, like, there's no boss. But there are, there are layered principles of self-organization, just like there's no boss in evolution. Well, who's deciding which organisms survive? And who's deciding? There is none. There is a self-organizing process that constantly evolves its fittedness to the world. And that is my fundamental response to the Stoic argument and to Tolstoy in particular. It's like, no, no, no. Uh, you, 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 you are seeing this like you... you, you, you and I don't want to be unfair to these people because they don't have dynamical systems theory. They don't know about opponent processing in biology, but we do. And so mm -hmm. we can't just accept those <clears throat> arguments in ignorance of, well, but how actually am I running? And when you pay attention to it, <clears throat> the, 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 the human proclivity to where's the boss is one of the things we have to let go of. And for me, this resonates again with certain central claims within Eastern uh, philosophical mm -hmm. traditions. The quest for where's the boss is perhaps a fundamental misframing. Fascinating. So I think what you just said, what you just laid out is a scathing critique of the Stoic model, because as you said, the Stoic system, you know, all, all these dynamic interplays with various phenomena can make it seem like we are guided by a little homunculus, a little Yes. commander somewhere in there, you know, pulling the strings and everything. And that's what the Stoics basically say. And that little commander is Logos. And you, you're you um, destroying that position. But you introduced it as a critique of Tolstoy. And, and I would think that what Tolstoy said is a kind of step in that direction of what you're saying, that actually you it, have it, these, you know. Yeah, yeah, it is. But what I'm uh, it, 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 Tolstoy is a step in the right direction, the compatibilism. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying, he's mm -hmm. still, so he's still missing a premise. Right, he's what, still missing the premise? premise. The premise that I just gave you, the premise mm -hmm. about dynamic self-organization, uh, mm -hmm. right, and, and about okay. opponent processing, and, and so he's still looking for. And I mean, part of that, um, I, I don't want to get too deep into this, but part of that is, sure. I mean, uh, I, you know, Tolstoy is still, uh, he's still, he's still caught up in. I'm trying to use as neutral a language as I can. The Christian idea of a soul, which is a substantial single source of agency and identity, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that will preclude him from coming to the conclusion of the argument I just made. Got it. Okay. Hey, friends, just a quick announcement before we resume the conversation with John Braveke. As those of you who have been following the podcast for a long time know, I lead adventure tours in Greece. And the next one is coming up in a little over a month from now, October 11th, 19th. So if you didn't get enough adventure this summer, or you did, but you want more adventure, now is your chance to sign up. These tours are unique experiences. We all meet in Athens, Greece. We hop on a private bus and we roam around the countryside for eight days with me and my friend Aristotle, who is a distinguished archeologist in Greece. We go off the beaten path. We go to sites that you would never visit on a regular tour or probably on your own. And we see some amazing antiquities while having a great time. I mean, everybody who comes on these tours is bonded by the common interest in antiquity. We're all like minds. We all like adventure. It's a great time. And um, we always explore a particular theme. So the next theme for this upcoming tour is going to be enemies of Athens. So we're going to explore different sites that in antiquity belonged to states that were opposed to the Athenian hegemony. It's a whole lot of fun. Right now you should be seeing some footage from uh, the previous tours. Click up there somewhere for a full video that shows you what these tours are like. And for more information about the upcoming tour and how to sign up, go to greasepodcast.com slash tour. Of course, that link will be provided in the description, but it's easy to remember, greasepodcast.com slash tour. Thanks for 
for attention. And now back to the conversation with John Ravakey. Peace. I want to get to Platonism, but just to be fair to the Stoics and consider all sides, um, I want to, again, test an idea on you. Sure. Which, which is a strength of the Stoic position, or let's say a very useful consequence for society. And this is something that, you know, if I, if I said this in an academic conference, I'd probably get roasted, which I would welcome. Uh, but <laughs> I think that, I think that um, <laughs> the great gift to humanity that this Stoic system offered, even though the system itself, I think is totally flawed, is the notion of the equality of all humans. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. where does that come from? I mean, people have, I've heard a lot of debates about where this comes from. I haven't heard any account that is really convincing and having spent myself many years studying the ancient world, I think in the Western tradition, it comes from the Stoic view of rationality, because when yes. you, when you say that every single human has essentially the same exact soul, which is this logos processor, um, they then move from that to say that there's even a, the, you even find this series of syllogisms in Marcus Aurelius and I think in Cicero as well, where he says, if we all have the language element, then we are all logikoi, rational in the non-Cartesian mm -hmm. sense. And if we're all subject to logos, then, then we're all subject to the same law. And if we're all subject to the same law, then we are all co-citizens of the same community, right? And mm -hmm. that's why we're all part of this cosmic city. And then we're all equal. And people might say, well, but then why did the Stoics allow slavery? It's like, well, they didn't have, they weren't <laughs> making the decisions about that. You know, they, they lived mm -hmm. in this particular world that had unjust mm -hmm. institutions, but they believed at least that, that the slave is of equal moral status as the emperor. That's why Marcus Aurelius said you can be happy even in a palace, you know, because yes, whether, yeah. whether, whether nature or God, which is the same thing for them, put you in the role of a slave or of a king, your life is equally difficult and equally meaningful. And I think that that gave rise to the notion of equality. I think that's plausible. And I mean, I think you get similar arguments in Spinoza and of mm -hmm. course in Kant about this notion of at least the universal potential uh, for uh, for the exercise of reason, uh, and 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 uh, and then the idea. I think there's an implicit in what you said is the idea that language use and reason will really will really expand the logos, make it right uh, to try uh, on behalf of the Stoics. This seems to be what sets us apart from all the other animals, all the other organisms, and is therefore um, the source of our humanity. And then, um, and then you argue what is in, what is inherently valuable about us is our humanity. And then I think that argument just runs. And I think it's still a good argument today. I haven't no in no part in any of my argument, and I keep saying I don't deny mm -hmm. the importance of consciousness. I don't deny the fact that to, in some important ways we are self-interpreting self-defining beings like the existentialists. I don't deny that, you know, uh, our capacity uh, for propositional knowing is important. All of those are uh, really the case. I guess what I would want to do, on the other hand, and this is important today, is to say, well, maybe we should, we, we should look beyond, like, it's important to acknowledge that, but maybe we should notice, you know, We've got good evidence that chimps who don't have language nevertheless have self-awareness. They seem to be able to track causal relations. Um, they, they, their, 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 their working memory is much better than ours, uh, which is really interesting. Um, you know, maybe we should really extend a lot of our moral regard to them. And, and so I'm really trying to be balanced here, Jack. I really appreciate what the Stoics say and, and the equality of all human beings, and, and I think we we should not lose that. Um, I think it's really important. And grounding it in reason rather than in what we're trying to ground it now in, which is unexplained sort of, I don't know, rights or something, which mm -hmm. is, 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 I find very problematic. Um, I'm worried that we're building a, a tremendous tower on a house of cards, um, <laughs> but that's that's another another thing. Uh, so grounding grounding equality that way, I think, is really important. I would temper it with, but there's the non-propositional, 
And organisms who excel in the non-propositional seem to have a sense of self, a sense of agency, uh, right? And, 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 they, and they can pick up on causal, like, and so we should extend moral regard to them uh, as well. So I try to get a balance between uh, these two. Uh, and so I agree with you, and I want to, yeah. I'll throw my hat in the, the ring with you on that point. <laughs> I would just want to maybe expand the ring to include things other than human beings for our moral regard. And I think that, that, that there's no hard line that attenuates out because I think we, we even know at some level that we have a moral obligation to living things that we do not have to inanimate things. And then trying to get that more comprehensive sense of being a cosmopolitan, I think is also something we should be doing right now. Well, that was um, a perfect segue to get into Platonism because, you know, one of the problems of Stoicism for modern um, thinkers, people, is that because, as you said, the the moral worth and the equality of all humans is, is predicated on rationality that leaves out animals. And, and the Stoics are notorious for saying that animals are basically there for the use of rational creatures yes. like, like yeah. humans, right? Whereas yeah. Platonism sees us all as kind of in a, in a, Buddhistic way, you know, we're all reincarnations of, you know, <laughs> souls going yeah. up and down yeah. the, 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 the scale yeah, yeah, of different, yeah. uh, of another yeah. food chain, let's say, right? So, um, a much more sympathetic view, uh, to animals as part of this soul community, community of souls. So let's briefly cover, uh, a few strengths and weaknesses. So Platonism, just to kind of, as a refresher, some of the fundamental tenets of Platonism is that, um, you know, beauty is the ultimate, uh, ethical ideal that kind of permeates all goodness and virtue. And again, like Stoicism, reason is the way to, uh, appreciate beauty and to become virtuous. Although reason is not as all powerful for this Platonist as it is for the Stoics. And, and furthermore, for the Platonists, math mathematics is much more important than in the Stoic system. Uh, mathematics might even be on par with language uh, because mm -hmm. it gives you mm -hmm. access to these truths, like, uh, you know, geometrical mm -hmm. truths. And yeah, so I'll leave it at that. But what do you think caused, you know, similar question, what do you think caused the rise of Platonism and why did it thrive so um, impressively in the ancient world? So a couple of things. Um, let's let's turn to the Platonic notion, which I think it's interesting how Stoicism and Platonism both go back so well to Socrates. And I think yeah. we need to, this is why I like Neoplatonism because it tries to get the two to talk to each other. And, and, and in that way, paradoxically, it might sound to you. I think it gives us a better um, a better grasp on uh, uh, so what Socrates was on about um, than uh, either Stoicism either pure Stoicism or pure Platonism. But that's another argument we could go into. Um, well, I mean, uh, what, what is the what is the missing? What's the secret sauce that Neoplatonism added to original Platonism that makes you call yourself a Neoplatonist? Oh, a lot. Okay. Um, so uh, l let me try that. So the, the, the notion of so the notion of the ascent in Plato right, is not clearly integrated with an Aristotelian notion of knowing by participation, uh, uh, right? Um, the, the conformity theory that Aristotle develops, which is the, I think, the core of Aristotelian science. And the Neoplatonists say, oh, when I know something, I take on the, sa I take on the same form as that thing. There's a conformity. And then Plotinus says, oh, I've got, I've got the anagoge, and what if, what if I put that into right, the, 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 the Aristotelian science of knowing, I get this idea that if I try to know a level, of a more real thing, that that conformity is inherently transformative. So you get this integration of an epistemology and a, and a, and a psychology of spiritual aspiration that is secret sauce. And then, and, and that very much, um, what, what it tries to say is, well, what that tends to do is it tends to satisfy these two deep meta desires, and you see this idea in Plato, but it's implicit and and, and it gets more explicated in right that you're you're getting an inner peace and you're in touch with reality. You and I talked about this, I think, mm -hmm. in our, our, our last thing, and so 
there's there's that and when once you make that move then this idea about you 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 really get the this okay what is this sense of realness this contact this conformity that can afford self transcendence and transformation and the and the neoplatonists do this deep reflection on intelligibility which of course is platonic that's why it's neoplatonic and not something else but they kept they come up with this idea of emanation and and return emergence up and emanation down now here's why i think that's really important secret sauce that grammar of intelligibility is i think being well disclosed by cognitive science the cognition is inherently bottom up top down radically interpenetrating dynamically self organizing it, it proceeds and it returns and that and then you get this argument and i can make it in much i made it i took a 2 hour talk to make this argument so i won't do that right now but here's <laughs> just as an intuitive thing here's the fundamental grammar of cognition now if you think that fundamental grammar does not conform here the aristotle conform in some way to the fundamental grammar of reality you get you get trapped into a kind of radical skepticism and solipsism i'm only gesturing at this argument as i said i can make this argument in more detail but the neoplatonists say no so i reject sol solipsism solipsism i reject skepticism so there's this deep conformity between the grammar of cognition and the grammar of reality such that i can contemplatively become more real as i realize more about reality and vice versa they are completely interpenetrating and that i think is amazing secret sauce wow okay there was a lot there to unpack so let me see if if i can yeah. let, let me try to spell it out and see if i got it okay and yeah. this is great because it ties into a question that came up in the in our first conversation which some commentators um you know asked asked more about cuz i was asking you there about plato's theory of forms and you mentioned in passing that you actually engage in practices yes. where you ascend, yeah. right? And, yes. and we didn't have yeah. time to get into that, but people were like, wait, what are those practices? Like, you know, what, what, how can I, you know, ascend in that way? So, um, but let's, let me just backtrack here. So, so um, Plato has this idea that through philosophy, you ascend to higher levels of thinking until you behold like the perfect absolute truths, right? Right, right. right. And, um, and Aristotle comes along with this conformity theory that when you when you understand some truth, you actually part of your mind conforms to that. So a little yeah. map a little map is created in your mind that corresponds in some way to the territory, right? It's not. Um, it's it's better than that. It's it's okay. it's like it's like the blueprint of a house, right? It's not mm -hmm. just a representation. It's an actual set of instructions. No, I have to mm -hmm. be anthropomorphic here because you used an anthropomorphic metaphor, but it's like a set of instructions for the formal structure of something. Okay. So meaningful structures are generated or formed in your mind as you um, understand things, which on the one hand en enables you to understand that, but also improves your yourself right That's it, it the... improves your contact with them because yeah. they share okay. the same structure so you get an identification relationship between you and what you know mm -hmm. so it's not just a representational relationship you get you get formed in a way i'm right so that you are mm -hmm. actually now properly sharing the form of the thing in the world i don't mean just shape but i'm using shape as an analogy here okay. right and so there's it's it's you 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 come into an intimate contact uh, and identification with things. Yeah, okay. that's the Aristotelian model. Yeah, and and you could see perhaps a seed of this in Plato already, who said that that like the mind is, or the that humans are plants whose roots are in the heavens, and yep. by yep. understanding yep. the functioning of the ordered cosmos and aligning your soul to that order, you are then improved yourself. But Okay, so so Aristotle comes along with this new cognitive theory of conformity, yeah. conformity theory, right. and then you're saying that the Neoplatonists, like 500 years later or 400 years later, they synthesize this notion with yes. Plato, and I think the top-down, bottom-up thing has to be explained. So most secular people today think that um, you know the world is this chaotic mess, and then 
things emerge, like forms yes. emerge out of the uh, chaos of atoms and molecules and everything like that, right? Right, right? And Plato said, no, there's actually, there's order at the top. There are these forms which are then yeah. Um, yeah. instantiated <laughs> by things in yeah. this world. And then, yeah. and then you're saying that the Neoplatonists kind of synthesize all these things. So there's, there's bottom up emergence of forms. There's also top down emanation, uh, yeah. emanation, emanation. Yeah. And somehow this new Aristotelian cognitive theory allows you to explain what? Uh, well, well, first of all, it allows you, uh, if, if you take a look at cognition, it act that framework mm -hmm. is an excellent framework. Mm -hmm. I'm propose. I'm, I'm, I'm arguing that okay. framework of top simultaneously top down, bottom up, completely interpenetrating. Uh, you know, uh, radically self organizing dynamic, which is the Neoplatonic model. That is an excellent model, an excellent model, and I really I will argue <laughs> this for a long time for how cognition works. And the idea is if that's how intelligence, if that's the grammar of intelligence, and presumably it's to, it has something to do with latching on to the world in intelligibility, we have a choice. We can either say it's, we can be Kantian and say, oh no, the world is like, that's a screen and we're completely trapped behind it. And then you have all the problems of how, why, why doesn't Kant degenerate into solipsistic skepticism? And I don't think there's any good answer to that. Or the Neoplatonists turn the other way around and say, well, you know why our intelligence is like that? If you reject the Kantian alternative, the plausible uh, alternative to that is because the world is somehow fundamentally organized that way in its ontological basis. Now that, and then, and then you get the idea that the principles, the grammar of cognition and the grammar of the universe are in some sense fundamentally the same. And this affords a profound sense of connectedness, which could then, now I'm going to answer your question, really significantly ameliorate the meaning crisis within a, within a scientific worldview. Wow. So, you know, I, I come from a family of physicists and they like the Platonist view of the world for scientific reasons, but you're also saying that there are psychological reasons that it's like just yeah. the healthiest way to, to go about living. Essentially, uh, uh, yeah. Right? Healthy, it, uh, it, uh, but, yeah. but, but it's not healthy at the expense of, of truth. It's not bullshit. Right. Yes. Right. That's, that's yeah. the point. Got it. Yeah. So solipsism, which is Latin for only myself. So the idea that how do you know you're not a brain in a vat somewhere? Like, how do you know yeah. that like you could be just a brain or, or even a simulation in some computer and you think that you're talking to me right now, but you're not right. So how do you yeah. actually know that you're real? And, and the, I guess the Neoplatonist view as well, I guess you can never prove it, but here's a framework that actually seems to work with all of our experiences. And it leads to this yeah, healthy right. desire yeah. to pursue truth in life. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Okay. That's right. All That's right. well said. Okay. So, what is the greatest weakness of Neoplatonism? Oh, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I, I'm not nostalgic. I don't think we can go back to Neoplatonism. <laughs> um, I mean, we, yeah. I, I often say we have to have a post-nominalist Neoplatonism, a PNNP, um, uh, because <laughs> they're, they're, right? so for example, the notion of, uh, uh, th this notion of static perfection within Platonism that gets taken up into Neoplatonism, um, that ultimate reality that that see neoplatonism had this another fantastic innovation which is makes it very different although they, the neoplatonists didn't really acknowledge this from 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 platonism and aristotelianism in platonism and aristotelianism infinity is defective infinity is the lack of order it is the lack of form therefore it's the lack of realness with Plotinus, and this is why it gets becomes so attractive to the christian neoplatonists you have the idea of an infinity that is positive um, of course, that's part of the one, right? Um, and, and of course, this gets taken up by Christian Neoplatonists, Ariogena, Nicholas of Cusa, make a huge deal of this. Um, but I think that notion doesn't sit well uh, with this sort of notion of completion, of perfection, of stasis as uh, ultimate reality. Um, instead, you have to move to a notion, I would argue, for something like seeing... Um, 
seeing reality is an inherently dynamic. The one is kind of the inexhaustible fount of intelligibility and the inexhaustibility and the reliability of its production of intelligibility. That's what I take to be a way of reinterpreting the good, that that promise is constantly uh, being kept for us. And, but this is a different model than the Platonic model of you no, know, what, what that, that God or, or or whatever is, you know, perfectly static, perfectly at rest, complete, finished. This notion of completion it just does not sit well. I mean, you, it, it does not sit well with our. And this is Whitehead's great point. Whitehead right, considers himself a Platonist, but he rejects that aspect. No, no, it's it's in process. There's evolution. There's physics, right? There's this unfolding. There's Big Bang, right? Like no, you've got to like the oneness has to, right? Be un, the, the the ultimate reality. If, if that's a better way of talking about the oneness, has to be understood more in these dynamic terms than in in terms of static completion. It's more. And you even get a taste of this in the Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which is deeply, deeply, in much more than the West, influenced by Neoplatonists, of epic state, epic tasis, that when we go to heaven, we don't go to rest and our, our, our job is not complete. What, you, what God is, is God is a perpetual affordance of infinite self-transcendence by human beings, so that we just continue to tell, and, that, and that's what it is. Um, uh, and, and so... I'm not introducing something that's completely foreign to the Neoplatonic tradition, but I'm just saying, especially classic pagan Neoplatonism, that's aspects of it that, that I, I significantly reject. Also, you have to write nominalism. The, the critiques of, you know, Wait, of Scotus and Aachen. Yeah? Sorry, before we get there. So, so you think that the bulk of Neoplatonism, or at least a lot of it, can be incorporated in modern ways of thinking without God? Like, you think it works without God? Depends what you mean by God. I mean, if you mean God as this uh, as this completion, um, this state of perfection as rest and finishing, um, and it's absolutely static and impassive, yes, I, uh, I think that notion of God uh, is not reconcilable. But if you have this notion of God as as the one that is the inexhaustible fount, and therefore ontologically, continually ontologically good, the inexhaustible fount of intelligibility, so that we will never, the, the, the knowledge project will never come to completion, right? Uh, um, the, the the project of, uh, well, go ahead, you wanted to. So, so you, so you, who I think are on record as not being particularly uh, God believing, um, you think that there is this inexhaustible fount of intelligibility. Yeah, I think I think uh, I I would say I would say it is a fundamental presupposition of our epistemic lives and of our scientific endeavors. Oh, okay. I, I mean, I, I think every even a single object, the number of facts available to us about any single object is exponentially, indefinitely large. And if I and if people stop and contemplate and reflect, how how many things could you learn about this? You go, oh my gosh. And then how many things about this could you learn in relation to this? And so, right, I don't think, like, as soon as you stop and think about how you, exp once we gave up the project, uh, well, not everybody, but once we realized that we could come to some sort of absolute foundational source of all knowing, like the, the foundationalism, and then we understand, no, no, knowledge is this inherently self-correcting process. Um, I think we have to understand that that we did that with good reason. That's because of a fundamental feature of reality. It's an inexhaustible source of intelligibility. I think that is just as worthy of being called sacred as some static completion, the final trophy of human existence or the existence of the universe. I reject that model. But if you have it like the way life is constantly, what's the final form of life? That makes no sense. But well, Go ahead. Well, now you're going to make me have to invite you back because that's something I want to explore <laughs> in its own right. But lest we get sucked into that rabbit hole, let me bring it back to Platonism and Stoicism. So, you know, we've been talking about these two thought systems as if they are diametrically opposed to each other. But as you've hinted at several times in the conversation, they're both, um, they can both be seen as refinements or offshoots of the original Socratic project. Yes. And I think that if you look at them 
in comparison to the most popular ways of thinking today, Platonism and Stoicism both fall under the same family of yes. philosophies, which yeah. are are widely ignored today, which is yeah. this idea that, well, first of all, that reason is the standard by which ethics is measured. And yeah. you have to believe in some either divine order or some kind of inexhaustible fount of intelligibility or something. You need some kind of, you know, higher standard there. And that's diametrically opposed to how we usually think today, which is that, first of all, we don't need God. And also, oh, we don't need any kind of top down epistemology. And also in ethics, almost all of our movies and culture and uh, political debates and everything seem to imply that goodness is something that's like in the heart, not the mind. You know, like how many movies say just do what you feel is right, you know, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and how many movies yeah. um, equate obsession with reason with like, you know, terrible fascist uh, villains yeah, and yeah, everything. Yeah. Right. So I guess let's let's maybe say a few things about that distinction. Why why are we so attached to this view that, you know, morality is something that you can just feel and and not it's not something that's rationally ascertainable because we gave up what you see through the socratic tradition especially like especially down the um neoplatonic uh strand which is the deep interpenetration of logos and eros um, and this is what my work on relevance realization is all about relevance realization is it's not cold calculation. It's simultaneously the basis of your ability to make sense of things, but it's also uh, the sort of primordial caring. You care about this information rather than that information. And I won't repeat all of those arguments, but, uh, and you know, you can look at other people, Damasio's Descartes era, the attempt to separate sort of l logical inferential processing from emotion does not make people wonderful entities it robs them of their agency like th this opposition now part of it was you got descartes i think truncating he removes the contemplative aspect of reason and he puts it just into the uh, into the computational the calculative and then and then the romantics react to that and say you're lo you're leaving out all of this other stuff imagination and emotion that is really important, but they they are bound in the Cartesian framework, and so they go that that way. And I see those two positions. Well, it's rationalism, empiricism on this side, and romanticism on that side, as equal mistakes that are locked into each other and perpetuating each other. And I think that's what. And we have to break out of that framework. So while I say both sides say a lot of important things, but I reject both of them equally. And I think we have a model that, that says, well, how can there be something else? Well, we've been talking about it. There is a model of how rationality can be much more comprehensively understood that encompasses both of these poles and transcends them, I think, in a powerful way and is more consonant with the cognitive scientific evidence of how we work. We've got to stop pretending that we're computers with hearts or this, this is really bullshit. It's really bullshit, and we've got to let go of that. Um, that would be my somewhat polemical answer. Now, you just mentioned Eros and Logos, okay? Mm -hmm. And you seem to, well, I, I got the sense that there was a kind of dynamic relationship between those two. Yes. How is that different from the mind and the heart? Because the idea about the mind and the heart is that they're separate and they're in conflict and at war with each other. It's an adversarial and you have to choose one over the other. And one has one has a kind of trustworthiness that the other doesn't have. And the positivists say it's this and the romantics say it's that. And I think all of that, the attempt to deify or demonize one faculty at the expense of the other, to see them as as distinct and and, and and that they're most properly understood is at war with each other, I think that's all false. Instead, mm -hmm. what I'm proposing is, like I was talking before, this deep interpenetration, this deep self-organization, right? When you are zeroing your attention in, it is rational in the sense that you, if you don't do that, if you do not organize your attention, you cannot begin to make sense of the world and make inferences about it. But that is to care about this rather than that. And that is also a deeply affective thing you're doing. 
And that's why you can't separate caring and making sense. They are interwoven fundamentally. I'm sensing a kind of pattern in your thinking, John, here. So um, <laughs> because because you mentioned on the one hand, when you talked about uh, me metabolic arousal, you mentioned the uh, sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And then yeah, you talked yeah. about epistemology. You mentioned bottom up emergence and top down emanation. And then now you're yeah. talking about eros and logos. So I, I feel like yes. um, the problem with the problem you see with a lot of these other ways of thinking, especially today, is that they, they like to to point the finger at one thing, right? It's the heart, yes, yes, it's the yes. mind, or this and yes. that. And you see all these different feedback loops and, and dynamical relationships at work. Is that kind of that? That's that absolutely, thing? Fair. that's absolutely yeah. fair, Jack. Absolutely. So fair. I have a, a ancient Greek epithet for you. Okay. You are you are the dialecticotatos, the most dialectical, because on the one hand, you I do would... all, you, you do I'm... all these dialectical workshops, but also you see everything as a dialectical process. You that's, know, right. So. that's right. That's right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. And I think that is a way of being true to the Socratic legacy. Okay, so I want to throw one last idea at you um, before we call it a day. This has been a really uh, mind bending in a good way conversation. But, you know, one of my friends in grad school who was also studying classics had a professor who used to say that um, Platonism will save the world. And I spent a lot of years thinking about what that could mean. Um, not actively, but it was kind of just fermenting in my in my head. And I think people know that Dostoevsky said that beauty will save the world. And I think mm -hmm. that what what this guy was saying was that it's not beauty itself that will save the world because if all humans die, if we kill each, if we kill everybody off, you know, there's no more humans, there will still be beauty in the world, right? Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. the love of beauty that might save the mm -hmm. world and the love of beauty is Platonism. So mm -hmm. what's your, what do you think about that? So, I, I mean, I think it's, um, I think it's, and this is, we're having deeply influenced by DC Schindler. Um, and the Neoplatonic tradition, I think it's the love of truth, the love of goodness, and the love of beauty. Um, uh, the three tra the three transcendentals, and the idea that they, unlike the Kantian framework that separates them into autonomous spheres of epistemology, ethics, and aesthetics, they're deeply intertwining and interpenetrating, and then the human love for that is exactly that kind of conformity, that transformative conformity. Uh, so don't think of love as a feeling, that's ridiculous. Love isn't even an emotion. Love is because if I love somebody, that can make me angry, sad, fearful, guilty, jealous. Love is an existential stance. It's a way, like there's a, love is its own way of knowing, right? It, it is, it, it is a, an existential stance in which you are conforming to something. Um, and of course, when it's two people, they are mutually conforming and they're mutually transforming each other. And so I think the sense of, loving as that kind of transformative conformity, the, the the dynamic system of the true, the good and the beautiful will bring us most, will give us, bring us most into consonance with what's real and so that it can place demands and constraints on us like love always does so that we can stop doing the self-deceptive, self-destructive shit we're doing. Yes. So in that sense, I agree. Mic drop. <laughs> John Bravaki, John it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. I'll come back anytime you want, Jack. I, I enjoy this. And I think I have very high regard for your work. And I wish you every success on all of your projects. I think you're doing really good stuff. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Ancient Greece Declassified. If you like this conversation, then feel free to click on one of the videos popping up on your screen now or browse our channel for more great content like this. And if you like podcasts, well, we have a huge back catalog of conversations about the ancient world on our podcast. So just take out your phone, open up your favorite podcast app and search Ancient Greece Declassified and you'll find everything there. Thanks again and take care.